Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. The real game changer was Cambridge Analytica. They'd worked for the Trump campaign and for the Brexit campaign. They started using information warfare. Cambridge Analytica claimed to have 5,000 data points on every American voter. I started tracking down all these Cambridge Analytica ex-employees. Someone else that you should be calling to committee is Brittany Kaiser. Brittany Kaiser, once a key player inside Cambridge Analytica, casting herself as a whistleblower. The reason why Google and Facebook are the most powerful companies in the world is because last year data surpassed oil in value. Data is the most valuable asset on Earth. We targeted those whose minds we thought we could change until they saw the world the way we wanted them to. I do know that their targeting tool was considered a weapon. There is a possibility that the American public had been experimented on. This is becoming a criminal matter. When people see the extent of the surveillance, I think they're going to be shocked. And I still fear for your life yeah. with the powerful people that are involved. But I can't keep quiet just because it'll make powerful people I, I, mad. I, I, I... Data rights should be considered just fundamental rights. This is about the integrity of our democracy. These platforms which were created to connect us have now been weaponized. It's impossible to know what is what because nothing is what it seems. Available on Netflix anywhere in the world. Anyway, everybody, uh, please put your hands together and welcome Ms. Brittany Kaiser on stage. Brittany? Hey guys, thank you so much for having me here. So glad to see a room full of incredible technologists and enthusiasts that care about ethical technology. So I don't know if you've seen my film yet before, The Great Hack. Uh, if you haven't, I would love for you to watch it in your own time. But thank you for coming to my talk today to hear a little bit more about why I believe and so many people around the world these days believe that you should own your data because I've learned quite a few lessons from the past about how we need to protect our digital future. So as you just saw, uh, in 2017, The Economist calculated that data had surpassed oil and gas as the world's most valuable asset. That means the data that you are producing every single day by having your phone in your pocket, by clicking terms and conditions, without reading them, you are creating the world's most valuable asset class. Yet somehow this is the only asset class that the producers have no rights to its value. Now, how much longer is that really going to go on? And I guess why am I the right person to tell you about it? I started working with data for the first time in 2007 when I joined the Obama campaign. I was a young 19-year-old intern, and I started to learn how you could collect data in order to understand what people cared about, what motivated them to actually go out and take actions on climate, on healthcare, on important issues that could change the future for themselves and their families. And I was so motivated by that, I spent the next nearly decade of my life learning how you could use data in order to engage people in this kind of inspiring way. I was a human rights activist and worked for charities and NGOs and United Nations departments, learning more about how you could use data for good. Now, I suppose, why am I here today with you? So in... Uh, 2014, I was writing my PhD. I was writing my doctorate on preventive diplomacy. 
So preventive diplomacy is how you can use different forms of power in order to prevent war, to prevent atrocity. And I started studying how you could use data in order to build early warning systems so that we would actually stop war before it started. Now, no one at my law school was able to teach me exactly how to do that. So I joined a firm that you might have heard of called Cambridge Analytica in order to learn how to use predictive algorithms in order to build a better future for ourselves. Now, after a couple of years of working at that firm all around the world and learning how much data actually existed on individuals and how it was bought and sold and traded around the world without any of the producers of that data really having any idea, I started to think, huh, there's got to be a way to change this. There's no way that we can continue to produce data every single day, and we don't know where it goes. I don't know how many of you guys have read Terms and Conditions when you download a new app on your phone or when you decide to accept cookies. Hardly anybody in here at all. So you don't actually know what you're agreeing to in your day-to-day -day digital life. So I started to think, okay, this is a problem that we're not protected by the law and regulation by many governments, and we also don't really have that many technology solutions to protect us either. And that's when I started to become quite a bit more of a blockchain enthusiast than I already was. And I started to get into the industry and go around the world at conferences like this to learn what was the current state of affairs of a technology that could provide more transparency, tracking and traceability, and consent mechanisms for building a better digital future. And I came across the first group of people that were really writing common sense digital asset legislation. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Brock Pierce, you've probably heard of, introduced me to an amazing woman called Caitlin Long, who was from Wyoming and was trying to donate to her alma mater, uh, the University of Wyoming in Laramie, in Bitcoin in order to start a fund for female engineers. And she was told by the law that she wasn't allowed to donate in Bitcoin. Now, she's not a woman easily stopped, so she started working with legislators in order to form the first laws that would create a positive atmosphere for creating blockchain technology within the United States and even the world. So I got pretty excited about this, and I actually quit Cambridge Analytica to go to Wyoming and support Caitlin and all of the legislators and what they were doing, because I thought it was so inspiring. And even now to this day, in the past year and a half, We've created 13 new laws in the state of Wyoming that not only protect your digital assets, but also allow blockchain entrepreneurs from anywhere in the world to start their business there and be protected and work under common sense frameworks. So right after everyone started writing these incredible laws in Wyoming, and I thought, hey, you know, that there's really going to be a bright hope for where this industry is going and how blockchain technology can actually change the data industry forever. This happens. <laughs> the first news reports that in the Brexit and Trump campaigns, that data had been used in order to create campaigns that were not either abiding by the law, or even if they were, they were abusing people's data without their knowledge. Now, I thought, oh my god, this is a company that I was part of, and people do not understand how much data about them enabled these campaigns to happen. So I immediately started working with legislators and regulators around the world to inform them, number one, how much data actually exists. <laughs> number two, what is the current state of affairs with the actual data industry? What are all of these companies around the world doing with our data? How do they hold it? Who do they share it with? How much is it actually worth? And next, what are we actually going to do about it? Many countries around the world didn't actually have laws in order to protect people, so there's new laws that we need to put together, obviously, but what kind of technology are we gonna use to actually track and trace data? Because you can write the best laws in the world, but with those laws comes the ability to implement them and then to be able to make sure that people are actually compliant. 
So, you know, why should you care about all of this? It's because the issues that we've already seen today are quite shocking with the way that our data is being used. And it's only the tip of the iceberg, because as you walk around every single day with that device in your pocket, you're producing exponentially more data every single year. And as we head towards a future where the Internet of Things is starting to develop, and it's possible that our coffee machines, our refrigerators, our robot vacuum cleaners, and even, I've seen recently, wall paint, will be producing data about the way that we behave in our own homes. How are we going to move towards a future like that with the unregulated data space that we have today? So how are we unprotected? Now, in Europe, we actually have the new GDPR regulations that recognize that as individuals, we do have ownership rights over our data. Our data is more like our property. But in the United States and in most countries around the world that are not in Europe, we don't have any type of legislation like that. So even though you are a producer of the world's most valuable asset, you don't have any rights to it. If you think about it this way, if you were going to share your house in the way that you share your data, say you're going to put it up on Airbnb, anyone that wants to use your house is definitely going to say who they are, why they want to use your house, for how long, and how much they're going to pay you, and then they pay you before you hand away the keys. And if they mess up your house, guaranteed you have the rights to get compensation for that. Why can't our data be that way? Right now, there are not a lot of new laws that are going to start to protect the data that we produce in this way, but they're, they're not enacted just yet. So transparency and opt-in. As I said, most of you guys probably just tick a terms and conditions box and don't actually open it up to see the sometimes 20, 50, 100 pages of legalese, this text that is trying specifically to confuse you so you don't know what you're actually giving away. What we need is more transparency. What do companies want from us? What are these data points that they're collecting? Who are they going to share them with? And how long are they going to use them for? Do we even have the right to delete? And this is another thing that is enshrined in the general data protection regulation in Europe, which is the right to delete and the right to be forgotten. This is something that, obviously, as a blockchain community, we are working to understand, but we are more working on transparency. How can we actually start to see what people's intentions are, and how are we going to opt into that in a way where we understand how it can be enforced? Obviously, a lot of people here are probably big fans of smart contracting, and think about in the future where we can start to say, these are the different things that I'm okay with my data being used for, and then you can agree to that. And because it's self-executing, you don't have to follow up and figure out if they're keeping your data forever and who they're sharing it with. You actually know when your data is no longer going to be available to those companies. So permission structures and traceability. You should know right now every single company around the world that holds your data and what they're using it for. Yet you probably only can guess by looking at the apps on your phone that those companies have your data, yet you don't realize that those apps are sharing your data with sometimes thousands of companies every second all around the world. I don't know if you've ever used a plugin on your browser that actually shows you what tracking cookies share with other companies. Some, there's quite a few different plugins that you can use, but if you accept cookies from one of the browsers that you're, you're surfing, you are looking at a website that within sometimes the first 10 seconds is sharing your data with hundreds, thousands of companies all around the world. So you click accept cookies just so that that box gets out of your way and you don't actually think about what that means. It's kind of a socially acceptable version of spyware. Now monetization rights, as I said, a multi-trillion dollar industry, the data trade, is benefiting from the data that you are producing every day, and somehow we're sitting here thinking that we don't have an inherent value as a person. On a day-to-day -day basis, the most valuable asset that we are producing is actually being stolen from us, and that's why we don't see it that way. 
You are producing the most valuable substance on earth, the most valuable asset class, and you do not have rights to that value. But I think there's quite a lot of amazing blockchain companies at the moment that are starting to recognize that. And they think that if you are sharing your data, you should start to at least get token rewards in response for that. Now, again, why is this so incredibly important? I'm not the biggest privacy advocate in the world, surprisingly. I joined a company called Cambridge Analytica because I believe in the future of AI and data science. And I believe that we can solve most of the world's problems with data if we figure out how to protect ourselves and do it in a secure way. Could we share more data if we feel protected? I mean, I think the word privacy, if you start to think about whether or not that is valuable to you, you want to keep something private because you think that if you share that data, it's going to be abused. And you don't know what it's going to be used for. But if we actually had a way of securing our data and sharing it anonymously or pseudo-anonymously, we could really solve most of the world's problems. How much longer would we have rare diseases? How much longer would we have traffic accidents and terrorist attacks? Probably not that much longer, which is why it's so incredibly important that we solve these problems before we produce even more data than we do today. Now, what are some of the laws uh, that are most important right now? As I told you, GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is basically a translation of GDPR for California, that actually goes into enactment in January of 2020. So that's pretty exciting. It's the first it's the first comprehensive piece of data legislation in the United States. It's only for a state, but obviously federal is going to start to look pretty exciting. And how else can we protect ourselves from abuse? Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren just came out with the Corporate Executive Liability Act, and this means that if a company like Facebook or Equifax through negligence allows your data to be leaked, they actually have criminal liability. So these CEOs will be going to jail as opposed to getting a small fine. Now that's really going to change things. I'm not saying that people should have that type of liability if they are being responsible. I'm saying that if you're like Equifax and you let over 300 security certificates expire and did not update your software 8,500 times and then you get hacked, yeah, probably a small fine is not good enough. A new data dividend law. Governor Gavin Newsom of California has decided that all big tech companies should start to tell you how much money they're actually making off of your data and give you a dividend from that. I'm totally all up for people sharing rights to data. If I produce data in a platform, but the platform allows me to produce that, we should have fractionalized ownership, another thing that blockchain technology is starting to allow. So what are the opportunities for the future? It's really important that people get educated, that we have common sense legislation and regulation, and that we have technology in order to fix these problems. So become digitally literate. I just co-founded with my sister the Own Your Data Foundation, and we are producing different curriculum for students, legislators, and companies, so that everyone around the world can understand the data that they produce and how to protect themselves. Next, I also started, uh, co-founded the Digital Asset Trade Association Data. We're a 501c6, so a nonprofit lobbying firm, and we work with legislators and regulators and blockchain entrepreneurs so that there is common sense legislation, and all of us are still allowed to build our companies, but citizens and investors are still protected as well. The current legislative framework is looking to change, so both here in Korea and countries around the world, and especially the US where I spend a lot of my time, tell legislators that you care, that you want your data to be protected, and you also want your technology companies to be protected. This is something that needs to be balanced, and I believe in both. And also, support corporate thought leadership. There are a lot of awesome companies that are doing exactly what needs to be done in order to show you don't have to destroy your business model in order to be someone that is building a better future. Funware, the first uh, NASDAQ-listed public company that announced uh, a blockchain program, is returning all of the billions of data sets that they have from people around the world back to the individual. And you guys have probably heard of Voice.com as well. It's going to be a social media competitor that is coming out pretty soon that is going to 
let people own their data, and you are going to get paid for the content that you produce in the platform, and there will be no bots and fake accounts because of the KYC AML. So no more of a lot of the social ills that we've seen from social networks that were made to connect us. Instead, they've torn us apart. So thank you guys so much for caring. Thank you for being here. And if you guys want more information, please contact me at Brittany at ownyourdata.foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brittany.